What's going on guys, Andrew Pillick Hockey here back again with another video continuing the Toronto Maple Leafs 2021-2022 player previews and this time it's going to be about Alexander Kerfoot. So if you guys are enjoying these videos, make sure to like this video and subscribe. I know there's a ton of people that watch these videos that aren't subbed. Tons of rumors, news, and previews coming on this channel. I'm sure to be posting every single day. Uh, it's not just the player previews. Lots of other stuff is coming. I have a lot of stuff lined up. So I'd really appreciate that. Thank you to the new subs and to the people that have been here since day one. But I love talking about the Leafs and hockey in general. So uh, lots of live streams and other content. Also, make sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. I'd really appreciate it. But again, talking about Kerfa going into this season... This is one of the those players where it's like, I'm still not completely convinced that he'll be on the roster this year, which might puzzle some people, but I'm not necessarily sure the Leafs are completely done to retooling their roster and, and moving pieces around. Now, we'll get to guys like Engvall and Mikheyev in later previews, but Kerfoot has been rumored to, to be traded for like two years now. And it's kind of unfortunate because when he came over here, I was really excited. I lost my favorite player in Nazem Kadri, but getting a defenseman and a good player back, I thought, okay, this actually makes sense uh, for Toronto. And Kerfoot took a lot of flack, and he hasn't necessarily been put in a great role by both coaches that have been coaching him. Babcock and Keefe seem to not know how to put him in the proper spot. And uh, that's no excuse uh, for him not, you know, fully performing up to what he, he could be. But Kerfoot's a really good two-way player. And I think people ignore that. They just look at the points and they don't look at the fact that he is a really good two-way player. He can play in a defensive role. He's really fast. He can kill penalties. But he's also really productive as a forward in the top six if you put him there. And that's the big question mark this year. Do you rely on guys like Michael Bunting and Nick Ritchie to be in that top six? Or do you slide Kerfa beside Tavares and Nylander because he's produced with them? Um, so this is something that a lot of people also forget. Kerfoot's only 27 years old. I think a lot of people look at him and say, well, this guy, you know, he's past his prime. He's not good anymore. You know, the Leafs are paying him too much. He's 27, okay? The guy is not old, and he's getting paid $3.5 million. There's a lot worse contracts on this team. And I honestly do hope the Leafs hold on to him because if guys like Bunting or Richie or maybe a guy like Hosang ends up making the team or anybody that, you know, potentially could have a spot in that top six, if they're not performing, you at least know that you have a guy like Kerfoot that can slide into there and produce. And honestly, the Leafs need to make that decision this year. Are you going to be playing him as a defensive minded third line centerman? Are you going to be playing him as a winger? What are you going to be doing? Do you want him to produce offensively or do you want him to be on a shutdown line? Because they got David Kampf, the centerman, to be a shutdown centerman. So where does that leave Kerfoot? Do you do you put Kampf on the fourth line? Do you put him and Kerfoot on the same line? Like just put Kerfoot as a winger? I mean, it could work, but it's not necessarily the best idea. I think the Leafs need to spread these guys out because you have a little bit of a two-way player uh, in Kerfoot on a different line, whereas Kampf is basically a defensive-minded forward all the way through. He's not going to get you a bunch of points. He, He's not the, he's not the guy for that. So uh, Kerfoot getting paid three and a half for this year and then next year uh, is a modified no trade clause that kicks in in the last year of his deal, which I don't think if he if he plays past this year, I, I would just think the Leafs are going to let him play out his contract unless things go terribly wrong this year. But looking at his numbers in Colorado, he's always given, you know, like the 40 points when he came into Toronto again. Both seasons with both coaches, Babcock and Keefe, no excuses. Both of them have not played him in a spot where it's like, OK, he's going to be an offensive minded guy. Oh, he's going to be a defensive minded guy. It's it's never one or the other. It's like they're just juggling him around the lineup consistently in the playoffs. Three points in five games. And then this past year, which we'll get to six points in seven games, which uh, if you see in the regular season, he was kind of far down the list. He, he didn't have the best regular season. But when it comes into the playoffs, he really stepped it up. That Nylander, Kerfoot and Galchenyuk line was producing. He was a major contributor to this team during the playoffs. I mean, the guy was two points off from being the leading scorer on this playoff team, which again, Kerfoot did his job. The Leafs needed secondary scoring. They got it from Kerfoot, they got it from Spezza, and they got it from Galchenyuk. 
the and Nylander, who is supposed to put up points, gave you over a point per game. Guys like Matthews and Marner, and of course, Johnny T being injured, so you can't really count him. But, you know, you didn't get a big point total from Morgan Riley, who's supposed to be that offensive-minded defenseman. The Leafs got what they needed from Kerfoot. The Leafs finally got a secondary scoring option and a secondary scoring line with Kerfoot, Galchenyuk, and Nylander, and they didn't capitalize. That's why this past uh, playoffs was really hard to watch as a fan because you finally get what you've been wanting. You finally get that second line that can produce and just absolutely torch a team, and then that first line's not producing. You're not getting any point totals from the back end. You got three points in seven games from Morgan Riley. You got three and six from Muzzin, which is decent. But Kerfoot's a guy that I think the Leafs are going to need this year. I think they're really going to have to rely on him coming back and playing a good role in either role that he's going to be given. I really am just praying they don't bounce him back and forth on the second line, the third line. Oh, let's try him on the fourth line. Let's do this, 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 and this. If that's what you're going to do, you need to really, really think about if you're if you're paying him that much money and it's worth keeping him there. You don't bounce a guy around the lineup that can give you a really good role in either position that he's going to be in. Don't make him suffer on multiple occasions in different places by putting him in, in spots that he might not be comfortable in. You can't just expect this guy to switch his mindset every other shift. It's not fair to a player like that. That's why I don't agree all the time with line shuffling. If you're going to try a line out, don't do it for like a period or two or a game or two. You need to give them like five games to try to connect. But to me, it makes a lot of sense to at least try Kerfoot again in that top in that second line with Tavares and Nylander because they already worked before. It's It's been proven that it works. You have two really good uh, centermen with defensive-minded games, Tavares and, and Kerfa. Like, people don't give Tavares that credit either. But you have those guys on that line, but they, they can put up points. They're, you know, Kerfoot's quick. Nylander's quick. You've got a little bit of everything. Kerfoot's really good at making plays. He's good at getting in the right spot. You got Willie, who's been a real good playmaker, but also showed you in the playoffs he could score a lot. Uh, Tavares, obviously, former 40-goal scorer. Um, he can put up a lot of points, and he does a little bit of everything. He gets out to the front of the net, and, and Kerfoot also does that. And that's why it, it kind of puzzles me why when we're looking at Kerfoot, people are like, well, I'm not really sure what spot he has on this team. No, he does have a spot on this team. But it's whether or not the Leafs value him enough to keep him in a spot for the whole season and not shuffle him around. It's annoying. I'll, I'll be just completely honest. It's really annoying knowing that he can do a really good job in one section of the ice or the other. So I would really like to see him either be given that offensive role in the top six and then stick with it. And, you know, halfway through the season, if you have to give him a 10-game stretch where he has to play that defensive-minded games, barring injury or whatever, or vice versa... Sure, do that, but don't flip-flop him around. It, it doesn't make sense to me. You, you need this guy to get consistent again, and when you were giving him consistent shifts as an offensive guy for seven games with Nylander and Galchenyuk, look how good he looked. He was producing, and that's what they need. So hopefully you guys get what I was saying here. I really wanted to drive that point home. I like Kerfoot. I think he's a fantastic hockey player. I think he does a lot of everything, and uh, he does it well. So if you guys are new here, make sure to like this video and subscribe. Tons of videos coming. Uh, I love and appreciate you guys as always. Shout out to Kerfoot for doing this thing on this team, and hopefully he can continue to be um, that you know offensive-producing guy or defensive-minded player come this season. Peace.